Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dion Flores, and I am a PhD candidate in community music at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. I am also the executive and artistic director of the Kitchener Waterloo Center for Filipino Canadian Music, Language, and Culture, also known as KW Centro, Centro being the Tagalog word, the national language of the Philippines, meaning center. My presentation today is entitled Confronting Racism in Canadian Music Conservatories, Healing Trauma Through Community Music. This is a capstone project for my Master of Arts in Community Music and serves as documentation of my own experiences with racism and how community music helped me to heal. It is important for us to acknowledge that the land upon which I join you today is located on the Haldeman Tract, land promised to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River and is within the territory of the Chonton, Neutral, and Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. As a Filipino-Canadian, I walk through life with a complex history of migration to Turtle Island. Even though my parents left our home country in search of a better life, I wholeheartedly acknowledge our role as settlers on this land and beneficiaries of the colonial project. We are eternally grateful for the opportunity to gather and work on this land and to call this land home. I couldn't tell this story five years ago because I lacked the ability to convey it clearly. It is my hope now to communicate to my audience my narrative, a story of how racism ruptured my connection to reality and caused me to experience a mental health emergency. I have been hesitant and scared to share what I really think about racism, learning about the way that white fragility and respectability politics function to shame and silence people like me and stories like mine fills me with apprehension. In my experience, I have learned that unabashedly addressing instances and patterns of racism is too sensitive a topic for many white people. They argue, evade, deny, or adopt the mantle of victim themselves, all of which functions to uphold white supremacy and quell any dissenting voices. Robin DiAngelo said it best, white people have been socialized into a deeply internalized sense of superiority. They become highly fragile in conversations about race, white fragility, and the functions and effects of whiteness will be an unapolo unapologetically loud and prominent thread throughout this article. In 2018, after facing both systemic and targeted racism and discrimination in graduate school and working in the field thereafter, I struggled to come to terms with the effects it had on my mind and identity. My mental health declined significantly, which profoundly impacted my life. I became, I became very depressed, fearful, paranoid, and anxious. A common symptom of psychosis, which is a medical term for a break from reality, is convincing narratives termed as fixed false beliefs, wherein a, person gen wherein a person genuinely and wholeheartedly believes something to be true, even though they may not have any factual basis to believe so. This manifested as an ongoing, fierce, and conflicting debate in my mind. I was experiencing exclusion and discrimination at school and at work. However, those around me did not believe that to be the case, but I was sure of it. Still, it has taken me years to confront and reconcile with the negative backlash I experienced as a result of speaking truth to my experience. This autoethnography is my truth, a retelling of my experiences with racism and discrimination as a Filipino Canadian music educator and community musician in the Canadian Music Conservatory system and how these experiences led to a psychiatric emergency. This is the story of how I became ill, what caused it, and how I rebuilt my life and the lives of others through Filipino diasporic scholarship and community music. I will direct you to my manuscript on my website, which is at www.dionjflores.com, which I will show you at the end of this presentation, to read the full manuscript and get a full breadth of the story there. Today, I'd like to talk through just some of the concepts through a conceptual framework that I found underpinned my experience. So that first piece of the first arm of the framework is white racial grammar and frame. 
White racial grammar normalizes the standards of white supremacy. It works to reinforce a white racial order as the way things are. It shapes how we see or don't see race in the environment, as well as if matters are considered racial or not race related. Quote, white racial grammar provides the deep structure, the logic, rules of proper composition of racial statements, and more importantly, of what can be seen, understood, and even felt about racial matters. This is similar to Joe Fegan's white racial frame, where he says, quote, this racial frame is an overarching worldview, one that encompasses important racial ideas, terms, images, emotions, and interpretations. In addition, Fegan describes spaces as being part of the social front stage and backstage. He asserts that blatantly racist thought, commentary, and performance have become concentrated in the social backstage, spaces where only whites are present. Much less is performed in the front stage, areas like workplaces and public accommodations, because of a pressure to be colorblind and politically correct. In a journaling exercise Fegan did with his students, he asked them to journal any instances of racism that they witnessed. One of his students, Hannah, wrote in her journal that it is this sort of joking that helps to keep racism alive. People know the places they have to be politically correct, and most people will be. However, until this sort of behind the scenes racism comes to an end, people will always harbor those stereotypical views that are so prevalent in our country. The next arm of the framework is the model minority myth. According to Ellen Wu, professor of history at Indiana University at Bloomington, the model minority myth in the United States characterizes Asian Americans as smart, wealthy, and compliant. But Canada is not the United States. That can't possibly happen here. We're like the nicest people you'll ever meet. Does Canada have a history of anti-Asian sentiment? Prior to World War II, Canada explicitly legislated racist immigration policies during a time period commonly referred to as the building of white Canada. Historically, Canada has also viewed Asian immigration as something to be deterred. For example, the Chinese Immigration Act of 1885 placed a head tax on each Chinese immigrant entering Canada. By 1903, the head tax was $500, which was equivalent to a two years worth of salary as a worker on the Canadian Pacific Railway. The 1910 iteration of the Immigration Act intentionally aimed to limit immigration to healthy, white, preferably British or American agriculturalists. Immigration was limited to those deemed desirable and racialized folks were construed as preferred races. By 1924, the Chinese Exclusion Act would replace earlier legislation and sanction an outright ban on Chinese immigration to Canada with few exceptions. This legislation would remain in place until 1947. In the 1980s, similar sentiment that Asians were stealing Canadian jobs were featured on CTV's W5 news program. Some things that were said to me as a perceived model minority in the music school were things like, you don't need to practice, you're Asian, you're going to be successful anyway. Right? So it undermined the actual effort I was putting in to be successful in school and said, well, you don't really need to do any of that because you're, it's a myth, right? Asian people will just be successful no matter what. People liked me when I was amenable, but when I became more outspoken and radical, people didn't like that very much. They, dis they distanced themselves from me. Is it possible that white folks in Atlantic Canada, where I attended graduate school, had preconceptions about me because of my Asian, Filipino, Canadian heritage and appearance? What if I began behaving contrary to those expectations, for example, like myself? The conclusion that we can make with the model minority myth is that Turtle Island has a history of anti-Asian hate, namely through immigration. There's a piece here about anti-Asian sentiment and immigration in the US, which I left out for the purposes of this presentation. But again, I can direct you to my manuscript and you can read about the details there. Very quickly, in a short, short one here, in Carol Anderson's 2016 book, White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide, she articulates that the trigger for black for white rage, sorry, is black advancement. 
it is not the mere presence of Black people that is the problem. Rather, it is Blackness with ambition, with drive, with purpose, with aspirations, and with demands for full and equal citizenship. It is Blackness that refuses to accept subjugation to give up. Something I noticed in grad school that in Atlantic Canada, my success was not something to be celebrated. It was always met with criticism and a scoff. It was, it felt as if though Dion had no right to be successful. We, we, we let him here. We, we brought him here because he could fit in. He could support the white racial order. And now that he's, he's, he's acting with confidence, he's outgoing, he's a leader. Well, that's not what we signed up for. Right. I felt this for three years as I lived there in Atlantic Canada. These are some authors that really ground me into my research. Um, in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire outlines the dynamics of oppression. He discusses the paternalistic and dehumanizing grip of the dominant class that, ha that sorry, that the dominant class has over the oppressed. He describes a submerged consciousness as a historical condition of oppression where affected individuals are unable to discern the forces that subjugate them. During my psychotic episode, I read this book at least 10 times, making detailed notes in the margins. At one point, I, I began to recognize what Freire was writing about in, him, in my own environment. I began to take action to confront these racist and oppressive forces and was met with vitriol and exile which I later came to learn is a textbook reaction of white fragility. Coined by Robin D'Angelo, white fragility is a set of defensive moves employed by white people when confronted with racial matters. This can include denial, argumentation, evasion, silence, leaving the stress-inducing situation, and white women's tears, which has historically led to the murder, mutilation, and lynching of Black people. This reaction continues to harm Black, Indigenous, people of, and people of color today. Bell Hooks in 1984 describes our society as the social hierarchy in a white supremacist capitalist patriarchy is one in which theoretically men are powerful, women are powerless, white people are powerful, and other non-white people the powerless. In teaching community, Hooks asserts that the first step to confronting racism and domination is to reflect on our first remembered awareness of race as children. Patriarchy, patriarchy, like any system of domination, for example, racism, relies on socializing everyone to believe that in all human relations, there is an inferior and superior party. One person is strong, the other weak, and that it is therefore natural for the powerful to rule over the powerless. To those who support patriarchal thinking, maintaining power and control is acceptable by whatever means necessary. Therein lies our power to demand change. Coming to about the end of the framework here before I discuss a little bit of kind of where this has brought me, um, Joanna Luttrell talks about um, respectability politics. In, in White People and Black Lives Matter, Joanna Luttrell explores what is meant by respectability politics in relation to the Black Lives Matter movement. Luttrell outlines a possible objection to BLM by white people in the following quotes. I could listen to BLM if it was less angry, if it was like, like the civil rights movement that is more respectable. Or perhaps I could listen to BLM if it wasn't so filled with hate. Coded words for respectable include less angry, less aggressive, less divisive, less incendiary, less courting of controversy, and less criminal. In my interviews for this project, I learned from my Black participants that Black women are discredited if they become angry or upset at obviously racist treatment. There is an expectation that we as BIPOC must respond to racism with cordiality and civility. This expectation is rooted in the upholding of white supremacy and works as a mechanism to cast doubt on BIPOC stories of racial treatment. If I can just give you a little bit of insight into a person with mental health lived experience who's experienced a psychotic episode in the imagination of a BIPOC person 
we live with the intergenerational trauma, for example, of slavery. As a Filipino person, slavery has a different history than African-American slavery, but we had to respect our owners. We couldn't talk back or else we would be killed. And so in contemporary society, when we look at white male professors in power, we have to, we were trained to be respectful, to be cordial, to say, please, can we have our rights now? Please, can you stop oppressing me? Because it's programmed into us that we have to be polite to our owners. And this is what my work tries to do. It tries to actively resist these mental patterns um, that people of that, myself, that I experience. And I, I try to find a different way to break through those patterns and really communicate my needs in a way that is confident, bold, and stands for social justice. So I bring you back to my title. Amidst all of this, how could I confront racism and whiteness in the conservatory? After realizing that reconnecting with my Filipino Canadian heritage was a more effective avenue of confronting racism than merely calling out white people for racism, I established KW's Kitchener Waterloo, sorry's first Filipino community singing group. This group met weekly, explored classic contemporary Filipino repertoire, and engaged in dialogue about racism and discrimination in the Filipino Canadian community. It really built a sense of community and sense of solidarity among us. You know, it, I could I saw the eyes around the group kind of light up, be like, oh, they're experiencing the same thing I'm experiencing at work. Okay. Like th that sense of likeness was really important to our members. The photo in front of you here is a photo of the Filipino community singing group performing classic 1970s love songs at my lecture recital in March 2023 entitled Music of the Philippine Archipelago, which featured music of all Filipino composers. So where are we now? The formation of KW Centro. On July 1st, 2023, I established KW Centro, which is the Kitchener Waterloo Center for Filipino Canadian Music, Language, and Culture, for which I serve as the Executive and Artistic Director. In addition to our adult choir, in September 2023, we established the KW Filipino Children's Choir, where our mandate was to reconnect Filipino children from across the region to their Tagalog language and Filipino values and customs. In May 2024, KW Centro is hosting the first ever Filipino Cultural Gathering and Symposium, which will allow artists, researchers, and community members to come together, celebrate Filipino-Canadian culture, and dialogue about critical issues our community faces. I'll cover this in the questions, but I started this organization because I, I had made a mandate from, I had made a mission for myself in my master's. You know, there needs to be some kind of art, artistic, academic, organizational infrastructure which is dedicated to forwarding Filipino-Canadian cultural preservation, language reclamation, all these things. I can cover this in the questions. So thank you very much for listening today. I welcome any questions and comments that allow me to deliver an even more fulsome description of my manuscript and the activities of our nonprofit organization centered around Filipino language and cultural reclamation. Maraming salamat sa oras ninyo. Ngayon araw in English means thank you very much for your time today.